Thank you, David, and thanks everybody for coming. It's a real honor uh, and a pleasure to be here to talk about the work that we do in my laboratory, which is about understanding the evolution of species interactions. And so I would say ever since Darwin, we've come to understand the evolution of individual species pretty well. Or we know a lot about it, let's say, from the level of the base pair to the population. But species are really you know, nothing without the other organisms that they interact with in their environments. Okay, every organism on Earth is a member of a community of other species, some of which it may obligately depend on. So you see the repeated evolution across the tree of life of highly specialized obligate dependencies arising between species. And this is true both in microbes and all the way up to mammals too. So across the animal tree of life, you see convergent evolution of highly specialized, symbiotic, mutualistic, parasitic, predator-prey interactions. And we really have very little understanding about what kickstarts the evolution of these obligate relationships. So for example, take this parasitoid wasp here that's envenomating this cockroach. What you see is the end product of tens of millions of years of evolution. And you often don't have very much uh, understanding of what got this interaction, this highly specialized interaction going in the first place. Okay, so some basic questions that we don't really understand in this kind of area are what predisposes organisms to fall into interactions with other species before any genetic evolution has happened? How do nascent relationships between different organisms fall? How do they fall into these uh, uh, kinds of interactions? And then after that happens, organisms tend to specialize on each other. Okay, we don't really understand what ancestral attributes of species and what ecological circumstances and selection pressures shape the subsequent path of evolution as organisms become more intertwined with each other, how they specialize. Okay, so what shapes the subsequent path of evolution? And then at some point, evolution becomes irreversible. Okay, so organisms become locked in, evolution ratchets up, and the relationship becomes entrenched. There's no going backwards, and we don't really understand that either. So these are the kinds of questions that we're interested in in my laboratory. And the group of organisms that we use to study them are beetles. Now, you're probably familiar with beetles that look like this really fancy buprestid over here. And you can immediately distinguish this as being a beetle because it has this structure here. This is called the elytron. It's a transformation of the anterior flight wing into the shield-like structure that protects the delicate hind wings that still enable the beetle to fly. The elytron's really a key innovation, okay? You physically protect the body in this way, and you can infiltrate many different parts of terrestrial ecosystems that are closed off to other insects that have unprotected flight wings. So beetles can live underground, they can live under bark, they can access all of the different internal parts of plants. They can live in dung. They can live in mammal nests. They can get everywhere, but they can still fly and disperse and speciate. And that's probably why one in every four living things that we've given a scientific name to is a species of beetle. There's 400,000 species of them. Now, in my lab, we don't work with beetles that look like this. We work with beetles that look like this. It doesn't fit the kind of typical beetle body plan. It's called a rove beetle, the family Staphylinidae. And this is a clade of 66,000 species. It's the largest family of beetles. And in fact, it's the largest family in the entire animal kingdom. And rove beetles are different to other beetles because they still have elytra, it's these structures here, but they're very short, okay? And they expose the abdominal segments. And the abdomen is flexible, very mobile. And this enables rove beetles to move rapidly through substrates, uh, chasing down other organisms. So what you have to think about is within the coleoptera, there's been the second, secondary modification of the body plan that affords flexibility, okay, and this huge radiation throughout the uh, tropical and temperate parts of the terrestrial biosphere of these largely predatory insects. Now, when rove beetles evolve this morphology, it's kind of adaptive for their kind of trophic lifestyle, feeding on other organisms, but it left them physically unprotected. It's a real Achilles heel in the soft, flexible abdomen here. And so what multiple rove beetle lineages did is invest instead in chemical defense. So at the tip of the abdomen of many rove beetles, if you break it open, you'll find a large exocrine gland that's capable of manufacturing small molecule toxins or irritants. Okay, So if you take, take off this uh, 
abdominal segment, you can see this big invagination of the intersegmental membrane that connects it to the segment in front. And it's a chemical reservoir that contains this yellow stuff. And in this case, that yellow stuff is benzoquinone, which is a nasty topical irritant. And different rove beetle lineages have evolved different chemistries, okay? usually nasty defensive compounds. And so by opening up the abdomen as a way to innovate, putting glands in it, rove beetles have really evolved into the chemists of the animal kingdom. Now, this is a really big deal if you're a small beetle that lives down in the dirt. Okay? The past 50 or 60 million years have seen ants rise to ecological dominance and exert chronic selection pressure on really all organisms that live in those kinds of environments. And so if you're going to make a living in leaf litter and soil habitats, you have to have a way to create enemy-free space around you so you can coexist in these modern ant-dominated ecosystems. Rove beetles are extremely good at this because of their chemical defense glands. You can see this ant attacking one of these rove beetles, and it flexes its abdomen around, blasts the ant in the face with this chemical weapon, and saves its life, right? And so rove beetles are really the poster child of a very ecologically and taxonomically diverse group that have proliferated in modern ant-dominated ecosystems. Now, What's really fascinating to me about rove beetles is not just their chemistry, not just their diversity, but the fact that many times independently, probably hundreds of times during their evolutionary history, they've transformed from free-living organisms, predatory free-living species, through changes in behavior and chemistry into organisms called myrmecophiles. Right? These are symbiotic species which are found specifically in the colonies of ants. Okay? And this is a lifestyle just to repeat, that's evolved multiple times independently from this free-living ground plan in rove beetles. And these myrmecophile beetles often forge really uh, intimate associations with their host ants. So for example, this beetle here is secreting what we call an adoption compound from glands on its abdomen that causes the ant to pick the beetle up and carry it inside the nest. And when it's inside the ant colony, it will lay its eggs. Those larvae produce some chemical that instructs the worker ants to feed the beetle larvae preferentially over their own larvae. Okay, here's another example of this appeasement behavior here. It instantly pacifies the innate aggression of ants and enables the beetle to live in and around ant colonies. This way of life can become really phenotypically dramatic. So for example, this is one of these rove beetles. It looks remarkably like an ant. And there's actually five of them in this small cluster of ants here. And the interesting thing is these ants are, have a very poor visual system. Okay, So the beetle is not tricking the ant's uh, 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 ability to distinguish other organisms visually. We think it's mimicking ant tactile communication channels. So this way of this uh, ecomorph, this kind of ant-like body plan, evolves multiple times in lineages of ants that we think use a lot of tactile as well as chemical communication. This selects for changes in the shape of the beetle so that they can um, pass under the radar of the ants' uh, uh, morphological surveillance of their nestmates. Okay, just to kind of give you an indication of how ridiculously convergent this way of life is in rove beetles, this is a clade of this is a phylogenetic tree of the subfamily of rove beetles, Aliocarini, uh, where you have the highest frequency of this uh, way of life, Myrmecophily. What you can see here is the backbone of the phylogeny are all of these black lineages, which have the typical rove beetle uh, body plan, which are these are free living predators that do not live with ants. But you can see over and over again, these lineages go orange, and you've got these clades and individual lineages, all of which are these really dramatic ant mimics that are symbiotic inside ant colonies and obliquely found there and nowhere else. And each one of these clades is host specific on a single ant genus in a different part of the world. So what you have here in these rove beetles is something very unique really in the entire animal kingdom. It's a kind of corner of the tree of life, this convergent system of social and symbiotic evolution whereby Every time a free living beetle like this has evolved to ecologically associate with ants, its morphology, aspects of its behavior, its life history, its chemistry, they've all evolved in a highly predictable way, leading to this convergent paradigm of social symbiotic evolution. Just to give you a kind of sense of how incredibly convergent evolution could be in this system, this is one of these ant mimic symbiont beetles that's found in South America with this host ant species, 
Uh, and this is a Southeast Asian beetle found with a totally different host ant species. And look how similar those two beetles are. Right? It's pretty incredible. But they're unrelated to each other. They each evolved from ancestors that look probably look very much like these free living outgroups. Okay, so you get really striking phenotypic convergence. So this is the system that we work on, okay? This clade that is predisposed to evolve from a kind of mundane free living condition into this highly specialized, behaviorally elaborate symbiotic condition and has done so many times over. And that's the power of using a convergent system because the organisms which have not evolved the trait that you're interested in embody the ancestral condition. So any of these examples of free living species from across the tree that form the backbone of the tree represent the ancestral free living condition from which all of the symbiotic species once arose from. Okay. So since moving to Caltech, we've tried to pioneer rove beetles as a genetic model system to really under, understand the symbiosis at a deep mechanistic level. Uh, and so a lot of work has gone into pioneering a genetic model rove beetle species, a free living species called Delotia coriaria. It's this beetle here. I discovered Delotia coriaria when I was a postdoc. Um, and it kind of came onto my radar because certain integrated pest, pest management companies in the United States were selling this organism for use as a biological control agent. So you can buy this thing by the thousand and like dump it into your organic cannabis farm if you're in California. And it, well, New York now apparently, uh, and it feeds on fungus gnats and thrips and things like this. So it's a highly effective um, uh, 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 predator. Now, I was kind of stunned when I discovered this because in this phylogenetic tree of rove beetles, I, I'd already sequenced this species. It's this lineage here, right? It's firmly embedded in this big clay that really at the drop of a hat appears to be predisposed to make this transition to life inside ant societies. And so for all of the phenotypic attributes that we're interested in, this behavior, chemistry, and so on, Delotia embodies the evolutionary starting conditions. So this is the kind of thing you can do these days. You can create a really high quality chromosome resolved reference genome for your you know, new model organism if you're so invested in, in doing that, and that's what we've done for Skeptobius. We've developed ways to knock out individual genes in the genome using CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. So this is the Delotia beetle, where we've knocked out a gene that encodes the white protein, which is a, an eye pigment, so you get a white-eyed rove beetle. And more recently, we've developed methods to insert exogenous DNA into the Delotia genome using either uh, transposon-based methods or uh, uh, CRISPR knock-in uh, methods. So what are we interested in when it comes to Delotia? Well, we're interested in its brain. This is an atlas of the kind of gross anatomy of Delotia's brain. We want to understand here these neural circuits that enable the beetle to move through the world and detect ants, okay, and categorize them as predators and execute chemical defense behavior. Okay, we want to understand that sensory motor transformation in this free living rove beetle. And we're interested in the chemistry of this beetle as well, both its pheromonal and its glandular chemistry. So this is the defense gland of the rove beetle here and these specialized unique cell types which are only found in Alleocarine rove beetles. We want to understand how they were stitched together, how they manufacture these small molecule compounds. We want to understand both these things really as a foundation to gain insight into how they've acted as substrates for the evolution of these specialized lineages which have moved into ant colonies from a Delotia-like ancestor. Okay, so a lot of work we do is studying Delotia's interaction with ants, which is the free living behavioral chemical ground plan, right? It's this reference point, the evolutionary starting conditions. And we compare that to the symbiotic species that we both collect from nature and also now culture in the laboratory. Okay, now, uh, Alleocarine rove beetles is, are a huge clade, okay, within the family Staphylinidae, but they don't, they don't come from a particularly remarkable phylogenetic stock, okay? So this is the Alleocarine here, and all of these outgroup subfamilies are quite species poor, okay? They're not really a big deal taxonomically. Uh, even the earliest branches within the Alleocarine subfamily are quite species poor. And then something happens 
along this lineage, leading to this clade that we call the higher Aliochorini, where the group now explodes in diversity. And we think that that thing is the evolution of this turgle gland, the defense gland that I've been telling you about. Okay? So we think this is a real key innovation behind the proliferation of these beetles throughout the terrestrial biosphere. Now, uh, a lot of what we've kind of been interesting, interested in is understanding how this ground plan in this higher Aliochorine clade uh, evolved. So in a, the first kind of major piece of work that came out of our lab, we've pieced together how this defense gland and these unique cell types were assembled at a cellular level. And what the beetles have done is really quite remarkable, where they've essentially built an entirely new organ. This is the defense gland of the beetle here. You can see there's this big invagination of the intersegmental membrane between abdominal turgi six and seven that forms this chemical reservoir. Okay, and there are two cell types here. One of them, these big green bulbous cells, we call them the benzoquinone cell type. They produce toxic benzoquinones, these aromatic compounds that activate trip A1 pain receptors. Okay, so these are really the business molecules, the nasty things which are giving other insects, particular ants, a hard time. But benzoquinones on their own are useless, right? They're solid compounds, actually really meaningless to evolve this. Uh, if it weren't for the presence of this other cell type here, we call the solvent cells, that produces a short chain alkane and esters that act as a solvent that dissolve the benzoquinones, and that weaponizes the total secretion. It gives the beetle this really powerful chemical defense. Now, if we look inside the abdomen of these other outgroup species, there's no such structure here. Okay, and these are really largely relictual lineages now. They've been forced to the kind of periphery of the environment where ants aren't really a force to be reckoned with. They're found at high elevations. They're found by in, uh, uh, um, they're riparian. You find them by stream margins and things like this. And they're not doing particularly well. If you go back 100 million years in Burmese amber, these are the groups that you tend to find. We still haven't found any examples of these higher aliochorines back then. So we think ants have swept to ecological dominance, probably driven these other groups to these kind of you know, modern day relictual distributions and inadvertently selected for these chemically defended beetles that are now doing so well in these more modern ant dominated environments. Okay, so that's how you establish this ground plan in these rove beetles that appears to be so kind of potentiating for this transition to symbiosis. And that's what I want to talk to you today about how you go from this free living ground plan into these symbiotic ecomorphs that have evolved many times over in this clade of beetles. Okay, so what else have we been doing as well as pioneering a genetic model rove beetle? Well, we've been developing a natural system of ant myrmecophile symbiosis, which is really the counterpart to studying this free living ground plan. Now, Caltech is down here in Pasadena, and uh, all along here in the foothills of the Angeles National Forest, it's really kind of one species of ant that's running the show here, okay? So if humans are kind of controlling this part of the southern LA County, this one ant species called the velvety tree ant is responsible for this complementary region in this wilderness, the Angeles National Forest. Now, the velvety tree ant's kind of amazing, okay? Wherever you go in these lowland ecosystems, you'll find it carpeting the entire forest floor. Just to give you a sense of how large a single colony of velvety tree ants can be, this is Tom and Julian, two of my graduate students, extracting a single nest. Okay, it's, it's arguably one of the largest colony forming ants in, in the United States. Um, it's absolutely everywhere, and you can find it all year round. And what's really brilliant about Limatopum ants is that we've discovered there are three independent evolutionary lineages of Aliochorine rove beetles that have convergently evolved to target this single host ant species. You can find all three of them living together inside the same uh, colony. And that's very useful. In Southern California, you don't really have that much of a climate. It's always hot. So you can always go out and collect these beetles. And we've just more recently been able to cultivate some of them in the lab as well. And so we use these beetles really as a kind of way to understand how animals, these beetles, have adjusted to life inside ant societies. And that's what I want to talk to you today about. Now, if you're going to make a living inside an ant colony, one thing that you've got to do is switch up your chemistry, right? And the 
compounds that really, really matter the most are chemicals, chemicals called cuticular hydrocarbons. These are long chain alkanes and alkenes, some with methyl branches, that are produced from a cell type in the abdomen called the enocyte. Okay, this is a specialized secretory cell type that uses fatty acids to manufacture these long chain compounds that are secreted onto the ant's body. And actually, all insects have cuticular hydrocarbons. But what ants are doing is using them as nest mate pheromones. Okay? The important thing about cuticular hydrocarbons, there's many important things about them, but they are actually pleiotropic compounds. They have two functions. Not only are they pheromones, but they also provide the insect with a watertight barrier. By creating this waxy coating around the insect, they stop it from desiccating or help prevent it from desiccating. Now, if you take one of these velvety tree ants and dip it in hexane and use gas chromatography mass spectrometry, you'll find all of these cuticular hydrocarbons shedding off the body. And it's everything from carbon 25 to carbon 35 in length. Okay, and these, the identities and the ratios of these compounds are very, very important for, a, for an ant colony. They're detecting this chemical profile, and that's how they're using, that's what they're using to distinguish nest mate from a foreign organism. Okay, so um, one thing you can do, one thing Tom Narragon, who's a graduate student in my lab, did, is integrate all of these peaks and try and plot where the ant sits in NMDS space, okay? So this is a bunch of worker ants here. All of this, all of these peaks kind of condensed down into a, a, a point in chemical space. Okay, so that's where the ant sits. Now you can take a bunch of random rove beetles and do the same thing on their CACs, cuticular hydrocarbons, and you know, they also fit somewhere in chemical space, but nowhere close to the ant. Now, if you take those three beetle lineages which have convergently evolved to socially parasitize, forge the symbiosis with uh, this one host ant, this is where they sit, okay? So they're much closer or indeed on top of the ant's chemical profile. They've convergently evolved to become chemical mimics, cuticular hydrocarbon mimics. How have they done this? Well, what we found is that they think there are two mechanisms by which chemical mimicry achieve, is achieved. The first of these is de novo synthesis. This is where the myrmecophile has evolved its own genetic capacity to produce a chemical profile similar to that of the host ant. So this is this beetle here, platyusa. Okay, this is one of these lineages. This is the ant trace in black, and this is a mirror image of the beetle's trace in red. And you can see it's pretty good, right? Like most of, actually all of the ant peaks are made by the beetle. Uh, but there's, you know, there's a peak here that the beetle has and the ant doesn't have, and some of the ratios are off, and that's actually quite a big deal. Right? Because ants are really very strict about what they'll accept as being a nest mate profile. Okay? So this is a pretty decent mimetic profile. But if the ants really antenate this beetle, if they touch it with its, their antennae, this beetle will get found out pretty quickly. And this is why this beetle has this other behavior, where it'll pivot around and secrete a big gulp of this appeasement secretion to the ant to pacify its aggression once it gets discovered. Okay? So the beetle's doing these two kinds of strategies. It's got kind of weak genetically um, based chemical mimicry through de novo synthesis of uh, cuticular hydrocarbons. But if that strategy goes wrong, it's got this appeasement behavior. We think in the case of platyusa that it's making its own CACs because of a few different pieces of evidence. Okay, one thing you can do is fractionate using compound specific isotope analysis, different cuticular hydrocarbons from the ant in black or the beetle in red and measure the ratio of carbon 13 to carbon 12 in these individual cuticular hydrocarbons from the ant and the beetle. And this is a kind of indicator of their biosynthetic source of origin. And what you can see here is there's a big delta uh, 13C differential between the ant and the beetle. And that suggests that they're coming from different sources. The ant is making its own and the beetle is making its own. Now, you can also keep the uh, platy user in the lab um, away from the ant colony and feed it fruit flies. And you can actually keep it for months on end and profile the cuticular hydrocarbons. And you can see it's still, after being isolated from ants for a very long time, much longer than the natural turnover of cuticular hydrocarbons produced endogenously, it's still making a profile very much like a wild caught beetle. Uh, the final thing you can do is try and take out endogenous cuticular hydrocarbon synthesis using some kind of functional genetic method. So, uh, this is the CHC pathway. 
This is what's going on in these enocyte cells. These uh, medium chain fatty acids are being massively elongated in length by elongase enzymes. Uh, these are then uh, reduced to aldehydes by fatty acyl-CoA reductase and then decarbonylated to make the final alkane or alkene by this uh, specialized cytochrome P4G enzyme. It's a member of the cytochrome P450 family. So what you can do is collect a bunch of platyusa from the ant colonies and just inject them with double-stranded RNA targeting this enzyme, and you get a reduction in bulk total CHC on the beetle's body. So all of this together tells you that the beetle is doing quite a good job of manufacturing a mimetic profile, but it's very, very hard for it to perfectly match the profile of any one given colony. So it has this one template fits all kind of strategy and also relies on this appeasement behavior to maintain this association with its host ant. Now contrast this kind of imperfect mimicry to this, right? Again, we have the ant on the top, and now we have a beetle called Skeptobius in blue here, okay? I would argue that that's a really good kind of mirror image profile of the ant. It's very, very accurate chemical mimicry, CHC mimicry. We think in this case that the beetle and the ant are, um, share the source of CHCs. Okay, and you can do this same experiment where you fractionate a bunch of different CHCs and use compound-specific isotope analysis to measure the ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12. And it, for almost all of these CHCs, you get a large overlap between the um, uh, um, uh, amount of C13, the uh, delta 13C, uh, in each of these compounds, and that coming from the ant. Okay, so where are these CHCs coming from? Well, we think they're actually coming from the ant. Right? It's not the ant to the, the beetle to the ant, it's the ant to the beetle. And the reason for this is it becomes very, very obvious as soon as you put Skeptobius into an arena with an ant, because you'll see this behavior. So the beetle, within a minute, climbs up the ant's body. It's magnetically drawn to the ant. And when it's up there, it seem, almost seems to kind of send the ant to sleep, like the ant is some kind of willing participant in this interaction. It climbs up on the ant's body and it bites onto the ant's first antennal segment, which is this long thing here. And then it uses its feet to scrape against the ant's body, scooping up those cuticular hydrocarbons, which it then smears over itself. It's got little brushes on its toes that enable it to do this. Okay. Now, uh, one thing you can do is put synthetic cuticular hydrocarbons that are labeled a deuterium onto the ant body, and you find that they're transferred in large amounts onto Skeptobius through this grooming behavior. And this doesn't happen when, when you house the uh, uh, ant in an arena with platyusa or Delotia. A little bit actually is transferred in the case of platyusa, and we think that's because the beetle actually feeds on the ant and munches the abdomens of these ants, and that transfers some of the um, CHC onto the beetle's face. Um, but this is a big deal, because if you can perfectly acquire the CHC profile from your host ant colony, then you are essentially a nest mate. You're not going to be bothered at all by these ants. You can go wherever you want inside the colony untroubled. And that enables you to evolve things like trophic specialization. So this is Skeptobius here, munching on the ant brood. This is the main food source, we think, for Skeptobius. It's able to access the brood galleries, and it's not bothered by the ants because it's acquired their chemical profile. It's also occasionally fed mouth to mouth by the ants. Okay, so it's accepted, it's fully assimilated into the social fabric of the ant colony. It was really surprising to us when we sequenced the genome of Skeptobius and found loci encoding every step of an intact cuticular hydrocarbon pathway. Why would the beetle have a CHC pathway when it's getting CHCs apparently from its host ant? It would seem like a kind of waste of genes in the genome. Turns out these enzymes are expressed. So this is the elongase enzyme expressed in suspiciously large kind of secretory looking cells in the abdomen that look like enocytes. And in fact, all of these enzymes are co-expressed in the same cells, these large cells in the abdomen. So by definition, they are enocytes. So why has the beetle apparently got an intact functional expressed pathway when it's getting CACs from its host end? Well, remember earlier on in my talk, I mentioned to you that cuticular hydrocarbons, not only are they pheromones, but they also provide a watertight barrier around the insect to stop it desiccating. Okay, and we think this is really important. And the reason for this is, 
kind of became apparent to us when we worked out the life cycle of Skeptobius. This is uh, Tom Narragon, PhD student, patiently trying to figure out the natural history of this beetle that nobody had done before. What he found was it's really the adult stage which is symbiotic, which is socially integrated inside colonies, which is grooming ants, feeding on the brood, all of this kind of stuff. And what happens is females will leave the colony and in damp soil, just at the nest entrance, they'll lay these gigantic eggs that a single egg will take up the entire female abdomen. These eggs hatch into larvae that are, in our hands don't even need to feed before they pupate. Okay, it's qu quite ridiculous. Uh, and after they pupate, these depigmented tenoral adults hatch out and go looking for a host ant to groom and then reintegrate into the colony. Okay, usually the parent colony, because it's the closest one uh, to, to where they're hatching out. So Tom wondered, maybe this period here, before the beetle has ever found an ant, might be particularly vulnerable to desiccation. So he collected the soil from nest entrances, okay, and listened to a lot of podcasts, waiting for this event to happen, which is the eclosion of these Skeptobius beetles from the uh, uh, pupal cell. Okay, so, and he was able to collect enough of these beetles to ask, are there cuticular hydrocarbons on the beetle's body before it's ever encountered an ant? And sure enough, there are. This is the uh, proportions of the different CHCs you find on these tenoral depigmented Skeptobius. There's about eight or nine CHCs that these beetles make. Okay, it's a kind of skeletal version of the ant's own profile. It's nowhere near as elaborate and kind of perfectly mimetic as a beetle that's groomed an ant. Uh, and importantly, they don't make very much, okay? They make an order of magnitude less total CHC compared to a beetle which has groomed an ant, and two orders of magnitude less total CHC than uh, an ant herself, okay? So they're not making very much. We think they're just making a small trickle of cuticular hydrocarbon to get them through this critical period where they're very vulnerable to desiccation, okay? Now, it's still a bad idea to really make any of your own cuticular hydrocarbon, however small, if you're going to integrate into an ant colony, because whatever you're making is going to break the perfect mimetic profile that you get from grooming an ant. So how does Skeptobius reconcile the need for cuticular hydrocarbons in this vulnerable stage? And it, it's really, the, it really not wanting any at all when it's inside the colony. What Tom discovered was that as Skeptobius moves from this tenoral stage into a fully integrated adult, it silences the expression of these enzymes. So this is the cytochrome P4G enzyme in the beetle xenocytes, where it's making this small amount of CHC. And as it grooms an ant, this pathway gets shut off, okay, to the point where these mature beetles, there's barely any detectable expression of these CHC pathway enzymes. Um, in their enocytes. And you, this is true for all of the different steps of this pathway, the elongase, desaturase, the cytochrome. They all drop down to barely detectable levels. So what we think is happening here is the beetle has enocytes. It can make some CHC, okay? It can hatch out of the pupa and not desiccate. It seems to be on a ticking clock, okay? So the pathway is starting to reduce in expression, but it gives the beetle just enough chance to find an ant, groom them, at which point this pathway starts to become silenced. We're very interested in the mechanism behind the silencing. Now, turning off your chemistry appears to be very, very important for Skeptobius. It's through switching down, to, to turning down this pathway that's able to kind of transform itself into this chemical blank slate, this kind of stealth imposter, this canvas onto which you can paint the cuticular hydrocarbons. Okay, now it's very hard to imagine how all of the behavioral interactions with the ant might have evolved before this change in chemistry, right? And so we wondered how far down this evolutionary path towards this form of symbiosis might a beetle conceivably be able to get just through changes in chemistry? If you could possibly engineer a Skeptobius like, uh, a Skeptobius chemical phenotype uh, in a free living beetle like Delotia, how might that affect the uh, biology of the beetle? So this is Delotia, and it has its own cuticular hydrocarbons, of course. So we wondered maybe we could engineer a Skeptobius-like phenotype um, in Delotia by knocking down or knocking out 
its own endogenous cuticular hydrocarbon synthesis. This is work by Hannah Ryan, who's a graduate student in the lab. And what she has done, using either CRISPR or RNAi, is knock out or knock down this terminal enzyme in cuticular hydrocarbon synthesis. And in so doing, you magically create this stealth delotia that lacks any cuticular hydrocarbons. Okay. Now, this is very preliminary work, but the, I think the findings are quite compelling. Inside ant colonies, this is skept uh, delotia here, this stealth beetle that doesn't have any cuticular hydrocarbons, it can really do what it, it wants. Right? The ants no longer detect this beetle. Okay, so that fits with this idea that just a simple change, turning down your endogenous CHC production, however you do it, is potentially unlocking the colony as a niche you might be able to move into. Okay. Now, all of these myrmecophiles evolved from clades that were ancestrally predatory. Okay, and one of the things that these beetles tend to always do is prey on the brood inside colonies. This is another one of these myrmecophiles, a different subfamily of rogue beetles sitting on the brood pile. Now, what we kind of thought might happen uh, when Delotia gets inside these ant colonies, this stealth Delotia gets inside ant colonies, is that it might actually feed on the brood. Okay, and sure enough, this is what we observed, it, not, it likes to munch on the ants, eggs, and larvae. And it's you know, not bothered by the host ants because uh, it doesn't have any cuticular hydrocarbons. It's undetectable to them. What we didn't anticipate was that knocking down this pathway and feeding on the brood would uh, then allow some of the brood pheromone from the ant larvae to be transferred onto the stealth delotia. Okay? Just through feeding on the ants larvae, it's now picking up CHCs from those ant larvae. And what's really remarkable about these beetles after they've fed on the brood is that they're now recognized by the ants. So this is one of these brood-fed delotia, which is being picked up by the ant. And the ant is, the beetles are clearly terrified, but the ant is not attacking this beetle. It'll actually carry it around the colony. And you see other ants coming up to it, seemingly tending it, possibly trying to engage it in trophallaxis or regurgitating onto it. It's quite quite remarkable, just through changing this one, the expression of this one terminal enzyme in cuticular hydrocarbon synthesis. Okay, so there's clearly a big vulnerability inside ant colonies. If you can get your foot in the door through chemical means, there's a way to further integrate or, you know, unlock potentially the social niche inside ant colonies by feeding on the one thing that you're going to try and target, which is the ant brood. It's almost as if the ants are offering the beetle these avenues to evolve more in intimate forms of social integration. So chemistry, you think, is a real precondition for evolving further down this pathway and all of the behaviors that tend to go along with it. So I would say, you know, Skeptobius is clearly a highly specialized organism, right? It's kind of pretty far down this evolutionary pathway, okay? And a really basic question in the kind of symbiosis field is what renders symbiotic relationships obligate, right? Why are they irreversible? We think the cuticular hydrocarbon mimicry strategy in Skeptobius accounts for some of the irreversibility of this way of life in Alleocarine rove beetles. If you take Skeptobius out of the kind of hostile social environment inside ant colonies, I mean, it's hostile for everything else except Skeptobius, it dies within a few days, okay, because it desiccates. It starts to rapidly lose cuticular hydrocarbons because it can't replenish them through this grooming behavior. This is the amount of CHC on a beetle that's groomed an ant, and just one day later, you're down to this level, okay? So it desiccates really rapidly. And we think after it's shut down this pathway, it's unable to turn it back on. If, even if you take it away from ant colonies, it's locked into the off state, essentially, and it can't switch this pathway back on. You can provide ectopically ant CHCs back to the beetle body when it's isolated, and you can rescue the survival to some extent, not massively so. So what is happening here is the ant's own enocytes are providing the cuticular hydrocarbons not just for the mimic purposes of mimicry, but it's the secondary function providing this watertight barrier, this pleiotropic function that's in fact locking the beetle into this chronic dependence, behavioral dependence on its host ant to re continually replenish these uh, chemicals. And if you take it out of the nest, it's the secondary function that compromises the viability of the beetle. 
So Skeptobius is really the poster child of what you can call the pull of ecological specialization. That's to say that as an organism evolves to forge some kind of interaction with another species, traits that are going to be adaptive in that context are going to be the very ones that enable you to better exploit that other species. Okay? These are this kind of runaway process of specialization, um, giving rise to interactions that are obligate, okay? irreversible. You can see that across this evolutionary tree here. Lineages never go from uh, orange to black. It's only black to orange. It seems to be a kind of terminal phenotype. You shed so much of your genome and your phenotype that it's very hard to become free living again, seemingly impossible based on this macroevolutionary pattern. But the other dimension to this is, well, just to say that Skeptobius is one of many instances. It's actually this lineage here. So you can see it's happening over and over and over again. The other dimension to this pattern is that these interactions are host-specific. It's only if you're going to really specialize on one or a small number of closely related hosts that those traits that enable you to exploit another organism are really going to be effective. So homing in on a single host and evolving host specificity is another dimension to this, it's really a precondition for this process of runaway specialization that you see in these highly specialized symbionts. And if you're going to be host specific, then there have to also be coordinated changes in your nervous system to recognize your host as the organism that you want to interact with and never lose sight of your host either. Okay, so you have to have host finding behavior. There's a dogma in the neuroscience field that highly specialized organisms are able to recognize and find their hosts because they have sensory tuning, some kind of neural specialization to cues emanating from those host organisms. Okay, so take, for example, this anemone fish and its host anemone. This fish is attracted to its host because of soluble compounds that the anemone is secreting into the seawater. Okay, and that kind of cements the association between the two things. This is understood at a much deeper level in things like, you know, uh, trophically specialized Drosophila. Okay, so there's a species of Drosophila, Seychellia, Okay, that feeds on a single fruit species, the noni fruit. And it's attracted to these volatile cues that emanate from this fruit. Um, and these same cues are actually aversive to generalist outgroup species. If you look in the genome of this uh, specialist Drosophila, there's clear evidence of positive selection in the sequences of its chemoreceptors. Okay, there are changes in the central nervous system that apparently render this insect particularly sensitive to these volatiles from noni fruit. Okay. Now, that kind of makes intuitive sense until you take a step back and look at clades of symbiotic organisms. Because despite this overt specialization and seeming kind of sensory tuning to host-derived cues, across old phylogenetic trees, or old clades of symbiotic organisms, symbiotic lineages just tend to jump around. They host switch. Okay, so these are these anemone fish again, associating with very phylogenetically divergent anemones. So even, across, even though across ecological timescales things seem to be so specialized, they're very promiscuous across evolutionary timescales. And this is probably key to you know, the long-term persistence of clades of symbiotic organisms, so you don't undergo co-extinction with your host. This isn't a kind of really nice example of this. Uh, host switching phenomenon over, over deep evolutionary time. This is a heterine clown beetle that is also a myrmecophile, and all members of heterine are obligate myrmecophiles. Now, the sister group of this specific genus here, or a very closely allied genus, which was obviously a myrmecophile based on its phylogenetic position and also its morphology, was found in 99 million year old Burmese amber. Okay, slap bang in the middle of the Cretaceous. Dinosaurs are kind of running the show, and in the, this deposit that has the earliest examples of uh, stem group bands that clearly demonstrate eusociality, you find this myrmecophile beetle that was associated, presumably, with these stem group bands. Okay. Now, this is really interesting because today, these beetles are not found with stem group bands. Stem group bands probably went extinct. Dave Grimaldi's in the room. I'm going to say in the Upper Cretaceous. But they didn't last too long, and they definitely didn't make it into the Cenozoic. Okay, but these beetles have seemingly host switched into all of these different uh, modern ant subfamilies and become extremely successful. So neotropical army ants, they're associated with many different species of neotropical army ants, which are a very recent radiation, and they've evolved these really remarkable ecomorphs, including 
uh, one named after Daniel Cronauer, who's in the room, this <laughs> butt beetle here. Um, uh, and so there's been this slow burn from the mid-Cretaceous. These beetles circumvented their own co-extinction with these stem group ants, okay? Host switched to these modern ants and subfamilies and did very well in the Neotropics where there's hundreds of species of them. How can you reconcile this kind of host switching phenomenon? Well, Skeptobius is a particularly interesting system to explore this uh, problem because the beetles actually exist as three different species, each of which is associated with a different Lyometopum ant in uh, the southwest US. And in Southern California, it's this beetle here and this ant that we find most of the time. Now, most of the field work that we do is in Angeles National Forest, where you only find the beetle and this one ant. But in a neighboring San Bernardino Forest, you find the sister ant species too, without a Skeptobius. We think it's kind of secondary sympatry without the um, myrmecophile. But sympatry between these two species, such that tree by tree, it's either Lymatopum occidentalis, Skeptobius' is usual host, or this sister ant species that's not the typical host. But Skeptobius is only ever found in colonies of this one ant and not the sister species. Okay, so what's controlling the fidelity of these relationships so that host switching seemingly doesn't happen? Well, if we want to understand this phenom phenomenon, we need to really kind of get to grips with what the cues are that these rove beetles are using to detect ants and how they're interpreting those cues as they evolve from free living to symbiotic species. Now, you can go back to Delotia and ask this question, this kind of free living model species that we have in the lab and ask how it interacts with ants. This is Delotia running on a little treadmill, okay? <laughs> and you can bring an ant in to prod it with a, on a linear actuator and you see that the beetle instantly kind of recognizes that it's something it wants to chemically defend itself against. So it flexes its abdomen and deploys that gland, okay? And you can use this tightly controlled setup to try and deconstruct what the ant stimulus is. What is the beetle detecting that causes it to release this chemical defense behavior, okay? So this is work by Jess Canwell in the lab. And she brings the ant into you know, closer, closer positions until the ant's actually physically touching the beetle's antennae. And when this happens, you can see it repeatedly flex the abdomen. This is this period here, this kind of dark um, uh, tone, the dark color here, this period where the ant is physically touching the beetle's um, antennae. And you get this time lock flexing of the abdomen where it's repeatedly moving it over its body and deploying this chemical defense gland, okay? Now, you can repeat this experiment whether the ant's dead or alive. Be the beetle doesn't care. But if you chemically strip the ant of those cuticular hydrocarbons, if it's a dead ant, you lose the interaction, okay? So even though the ant is physically touching the beetle still, if those CHCs aren't on the ant's body, you get no flexing, no chemical defense behavior. Okay, so the CHCs to be, appear to be very important for this. How are the CHCs being transduced? Well, we think that they are being transduced by canonical odorant receptors. There are a large number of chemoreceptors, odorant receptors, gustatory receptors, ionotropic receptors expressed on the beetle's appendages and also in the abdomen. Um, and you might think it's a kind of needle in a haystack trying to figure out which one of these receptors is responding to ant cuticular hydrocarbons or other ant cues. But in one kind of simple genetic experiment, you can remove input through all of these canonical odorant receptors. And the way you can do that is by knocking out the co-receptor that the majority of these odorant receptors need in order to function and transduce different odors. And in the first CRISPR mutants that were made in my laboratory by David Miller and Mina Yousefaliya, we knocked out the orco locus by introducing a large deletion um, uh, into this gene, effectively making a beetle which has a very, very compromised sense of smell. Now, if you tether this beetle onto the ball and present it with a, a live ant or a dead ant, again, it doesn't matter, you again kill the interaction, okay? So we think that CHCs are very important for the beetle to detect the ant, classify it as a threat, chemically defend itself, and those CHCs are probably being transduced via odorant receptors, okay? so. What you have to imagine is as the beetle's moving through the world, it's bumping into an ant in the leaf litter, it's detecting those cuticular hydrocarbons, and that causes it to release this chemical defense behavior. And the readout of that 
in our kind of setup is the flexing of the abdomen, the deployment of the defense gland. Is you kind of an indication of what the beetle's thinking when it um, encounters an ant. Okay, so this is the kind of chemical, ecological ground plan of rove beetles as, you know, as they, uh, they're living in these ant-dominated environments. How has it evolved in these many lineages of myrmecophile that have arisen from this kind of um, uh, ancestral condition? Well, you can put Skeptobius into an arena, and you'll see within a minute it's climbed up on top of the host ant. This is work by Julian Wagner, who's a, a graduate student in the lab. And you can just kind of crudely measure the distance apart between the beetle and the ant over a period of hours. And you can see the beetle spends maybe 80% of its life or something you know, on top of the ant, grooming. Okay? In these arenas, it's just really always up there. Okay? It's just to kind of repeat what I said earlier, it just seems magnetically drawn to the ant. If you put another random insect in there, like a hermipteran bug, you see no such interaction. The, you know, the beetle doesn't care. The bug seemingly doesn't care. It's kind of whizzing around like a washing machine. There's no interaction there at all. So there's clearly something special about the ant that the bug doesn't have. And we think that special thing are the ant-specific cuticular hydrocarbons. You can show that through a number of experiments. First of all, you can kill an ant and Skeptobius will climb up on top of it and do this high-frequency grooming behavior, and you get these really long bouts of grooming, just like this. But if you strip that ant of cuticular hydrocarbons, then you kill the interaction. And then you can do one of two different experiments. One of those is just to put the CHCs back on the ant corpse, and Skeptobius will climb up and groom it. But the experiment I really like is that we found a non-ant insect that Skeptobius will actually groom. The only non-ant insect that Skeptobius will actually groom is another one of those myrmecophile beetles that chemically mimics the host ant. Okay, so this is Platyusa here. Julian's killed Platyusa, and that allows Skeptobius to climb up on top of this beetle that smells exactly like an ant, and it will execute the same grooming behavior that it normally does with ants. Okay, so the CHCs, we think, are the host recognition cues for Skeptobius. To, initiate this grooming behavior so it can acquire the chemical identity of the colony. There are other cues that Skeptobius is eavesdropping on. If you take total ant extract, okay, you can fractionate it, or Jocelyn Miller at Riverside, who's a brilliant chemical ecologist, can do this. You can fractionate into polar, non-polar compounds, which are largely the CHCs, uh, or, and a polar fraction, which is mostly composed of these iridoid chemicals, which are the ants' trail pheromones. When they form these large um, foraging trails across the landscape that can be you know, a couple of hundred meters long, you've seen the size of these colonies, they're putting this sticky iridoid trail across the landscape. And you sometimes see Skeptobius walking along these trails with a host ant. So you can take this polar fraction and paint it into circles uh, in little arenas, and you'll see Skeptobius walk around and around religiously following these trails, sometimes for hundreds of meters. And a, you know, a free living beetle like Deloti would just walk around the edge of, of this arena. You can, these are some of Skeptobius' uh, tracks as, uh, as, as, it, as it follows these iridoid trails. We think these iridoids, in fact, are aversive to free living ancestral rove beetles. So this is, again, Delotia in a, a Y maze uh, odor assay where on one side of the uh, chamber, we've put these iridoids and volatilized them. And you see um, uh, Deloti doesn't walk up this branch of the chamber. Okay? But if you take that orco mutant that doesn't have a very good sense of smell, it will now walk up here. Okay? So we think both the CHCs and these iridoids are being transduced by canonical odor interceptors. So to summarize, the ant is making these compounds, these cuticular hydrocarbons and these iridoids that in the free living species are necessary we're not sure they're sufficient, but they're definitely necessary for eliciting this defensive behavior in these beetles, chemical defense behavior. And also, they're kind of aversive. Iridoids, in fact, bind to trip A1 channels, pain receptors. Okay? So it's not surprising that they're aversive. But these very same compounds in the symbiotic species have now been co-opted as host recognition and host finding cues. So really what Skeptobius is doing is 
basically the exact same thing the ant is doing. It's using CHCs, not as nest mate pheromones, but as host recognition cues that elicit grooming behavior. And it's using these iridoids, not to forage across the landscape, but to follow trails of its host ant so it can move out of the colony. This is how we think it actually disperses and maintains gene flow. Now, getting back to this question of host specificity, the dogma in the field for why Skeptobius only in nature associates with the single host ant the dogma will tell you that somewhere in these iridoids or these CHCs is the information the beetle is using to maintain this stringent partnership with just a single host ant species. Okay, and that's really what we thought as well. But it's a very easy model to test, because all you really need to do is take this other ant species that Skeptobius does not live with in nature and put it into the arena with Skeptobius. And we predicted that Skeptobius would show no interest towards this ant, right, because it doesn't have the right chemistry. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, within a minute, again, Skeptobius would climb up on this non-host ant and starts grooming it in much the same way it does with its usual host ant species. Okay, so in the lab, at least, it's, it's promiscuous. You can take these beetles after they've groomed the ant for some time, okay, and profile their chemicals, and they start to assume the CHC profile of the non-host ant species. And once they've got that far, you can introduce them into a colony of this non-host ant, and they can live for weeks. So you can engineer something in the lab, a host switch, which, as far as we know, has not happened in nature. So this is counterintuitive. You can push this experiment really to the limit and put Skeptobius into an arena with you know, two ant species, which is the best part of 100 million years divergent from its usual host ant. There's a wood ant and a, a species of harvester ant. Skeptobus will climb up and groom both of these ants. Okay? And you can put one of these 95 million year divergent ants and its typical host ant into the same arena, and it's like flipping a coin which ant the beetle will groom. It shows no preference from one ant over the other. Skeptobius will also follow the iridoid trail pheromones of the sister ant species and other iridoids produced by other ant species. So this is the beetle following religiously these uh, Limatobum occidentale host trails. And this is the beetle following the non-host uh, trail. Okay, So it's not discriminating against the chemicals on the ant's bodies or the trail pheromones they're producing. So arguably, there's no chemosensory specialization in this beetle, okay? So you have to wonder wherein lies host specificity. We need some alternative explanation for why in nature this beetle is found with only a single host ant. Now, what's kind of really important, I think, is to understand that Skeptobius acquires its chemical profile from its host ant, okay? So now, if you put Skeptobius into an arena with its usual host ant, it survives just fine, okay? But if you put Skeptobius into an arena with a non-host ant, it gets recognized as a non-nest mate and killed pretty quickly. And those experiments I showed you previously where Skeptobius was on top of the ant grooming it, those were done when we'd prevented the ant from actually biting the beetle by putting UV glue onto the ant's mandibles. Okay? It's a bit of a trick. But it gives Skeptobius this fighting chance to climb up on top of the ant and groom it and release this kind of latent non-host specificity, okay? It tells you that Skeptobius can and would interact with many other ant species, but those ant species are trying to keep Skeptobius out, okay? So this leads us to this kind of alternative model for the fidelity of these partnerships between these beetles and ants. In nature, Skeptobius is found with just one ant species, but as we can demonstrate, it has this latent capacity to interact with many phylogenetically diverse ant species. But it comes with cuticular hydrocarbon baggage from the colony it's just been in so that these other ant species keep it out. So we think rather than the agency of host specificity being on the part of the beetle, host specificity is enforced by these non-adaptive interactions with other ant species. Okay? It's externally enforced. This alternative kind of paradigm for host specificity. Now, what does this lifestyle mean for the evolution of the sensory system of this beetle. If it's not, there's not really much evidence of sensory tuning here, what's happening to its uh, sensory systems? So we were very interested to inquire uh, 
what its odorant receptors that are encoded in its genome look like. Most insects have very large numbers of odorant receptors. And so we sequenced the uh, antennal transcriptomes of Skeptobius, Delotia, and also this beetle Lysagria, which is about 5 to 10 million years divergent from Skeptobius, but is free living. So it's the closest free living outgroup we could find to Skeptobius. When you do that, you can create you know, a phylogenetic tree of all these odorant receptors, which is kind of complicated to look at. But there's two things to take home from the topology of this tree. One of them is that this three species phylogeny is repeated over and over again many times across the tree. Okay? And what that tells you is that there's one-to-one -one orthology between many of the odorant receptors, in fact, the vast majority of them that are in the genome of Skeptobius and these other phylogenetically divergent outgroup beetles, even though Delotia and Skeptobius share a common ancestor 80 to 100 million years ago, there's not been rapid turnover of the odorant receptors in these beetles' genomes. Okay? So when you see uh, Delotia act interacting defensively with an ant, or Skeptobius um, interacting symbiotically with its host ant, perhaps there are orthologous sets of cuticular, uh, uh, cuticular hydrocarbon od uh, transducing odorant receptors in the antennae of both these beetles that are basically the same. Okay? So the chemosensory periphery of these beetles may be conserved. And it's how they're responding, how they're evaluating, how they're appraising that information that may have switched. The valence may have gone from negative, defensive, to positive, symbiotic. Okay? So that's something we're very interested in, in exploring uh, kind of deeper neurobiological level. The second pattern is one of massive loss of odorant receptors from the genome of Skeptobius. It's got less than half the number of odorant receptors that Delotia has, and still a large number fewer than the closest free living outgroup. Okay. And so you can imagine when you live in an environment like this and you're surrounded constantly by your host ant, Okay, it's very different to living in the outside world and being free living. You probably don't need all that many odorant receptors, and you shed the ones that are needed for being free living. This causes a big loss of the total number of odorant receptors in your genome. Okay? But it also probably means if you're surrounded by your host all the time, you don't need particularly powerful discriminatory ability to pick out cues coming from your host in an environment of competing stimuli. Okay, so when you take this beetle out of the colony and put it with another ant, as long as it ticks a few boxes in terms of the CACs on the body of that ant, Skeptobius is willingly, willing to accept this other non-host ant as something it will groom and try and integrate with. And that contrasts with something like an aerial insect, like Drosophila seychellia. As this thing flies through the air, there are many competing stimuli that it needs to filter out in order to home in on its... Uh, the one uh, host fruit that it, it, it feeds on. Okay. So maybe we can kind of reconcile this problem of host switching, this kind of paradox that organisms over ecological timescales appear to be so host specific, whereas over evolutionary timescales, they're much more promiscuous and jumping around. Okay. You, what you can see with Skeptobius, which is ho extremely host specific, is this latent capacity to interact with many different host ant species. You can kind of unlock that in the lab. You realize there's actually no sensory tuning to the cues coming from the host ant. Okay? Maybe host switching across phylogenetic trees is unlocking that latent capacity to interact with compatible hosts, probably key to the long term fates of many symbiotic clades of organisms. Okay? And maybe the expectation should be for many different kinds of symbiotic species, which especially those ones that are embedded in their host, like myrmecophiles, that there might not be that much in the way of sensory tuning, and degenerative evolution of your sensory system might be the status quo. Okay? And that may enhance the probability of host switching if you don't have much discriminatory power. Okay. I will stop there. I'll thank you all for listening. Uh, but in particular, I would like to thank all the members of my lab who've uh, done this work since I moved to Caltech um, and the various people who funded it, including the Simons Foundation. Thank you very much. Thank you for a fascinating talk. We have time for some questions. Joy.
So thanks, Joe. That was a really great talk. Thanks. Um, I was really happy to see when you finally got to the part where there was promiscuity, or at least an attempt at promiscuous behavior. And that was, the, and the reason I was happy to see that is because it wasn't making a lot of sense to me that there wouldn't be. And I think that's maybe coming from my bias studying pathogens. But in pathogens, you know, about fifty percent of species are generalists. Right. Right. And um, you know, and so. Yeah, it was surprising that in none of your cases did you have a generalist. So the answer seems to be, you know, that when that that there's some hosts. I mean, I think of, I think about your your uh, beetles kind of as parasites, right? Yeah. And so there's some hosts then, right, that are just like resistant to everything because right. nobody could cheat them, right? Yeah. Um, but the, but that's not completely true because you also showed, you know, that there was convergence. So there's you know, in your in your diagram, there maybe was you know ten different pairs or something like that, right? So my question is like, why wouldn't the uh, the beetles that um, manage to be cheaters um, be able to use at least multiple of those ten susceptible host species? I mean, I think the kind of enforced specificity model probably explains it. Like, it's very hard to jump into a new host when on your, you've got this environmentally acquired identity of foreign that you've got from the colony that, that you've just been inside. I think it's precarious, and I think in, under some circumstances, host switching can be favored. But like, it's obviously stable enough to constrain the specificity for, of most of these beta lineages. Um, but yeah, I, 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 like, I mean, the, the observed pattern in nature is not one of gen generalism, it's, it's of extreme specificity. And then when you kind of scratch that, you find that it's kind of counterintuitive. The beetle kind of wants to be a generalist, but is, is being kind of forced to be host-specific. And again, it just kind of puts the agency outside of the beetle's control. And many of these myrmecophiles that like are integrated are probably all doing strategies like Skeptobius, where they're, they're turning off their CHCs, they're grooming, this kind of thing, okay. I think their dispersal capacity is really reduced as well because you know you're going to desiccate. They get very kind of you know locked into their host colonies, and should the rare opportunity arise to interact with another ant species, they're kind of screwed because they smell like that other ant species. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of. I went from thinking that there'd be you know sensory tuning, the kind of you know traditional way of thinking about things to having to invoke an alternative you know pat, like model for what's constraining the, the, the these relationships and so i think enforcement like this external enforcement is my answer to if you had done an experiment where you had you know taken the ants that uh, don't get parasitized mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, but you uh, that don't get parasitized by that particular beetle mm -hmm. Um, if you had repeated that experiment using ants that do get parasitized by a different beetle, what would have happened? Did you? Try like most of those ants that don't get parasitized by that specific beetle have got their own myrmecophiles. Like any large col a colony forming ant species has got its own menagerie of these things. So you know, I'm, I'm I'm not convinced that what's keeping the beetle out is competitive exclusion by other myrmecophiles. Um, it's possible, I guess. But. Thank you for such a wonderful, wonderful talk. I have about 10,000 questions, but the big one that I'm trying to understand is what's in it for the ant? Oh, I should have prefaced the whole talk by saying that I use symbiosis as a blanket term to mean anything from parasitism to mutualism. And this is, I think, at least evolves pretty squarely in the parasitism exploitation category. These are, this is a clade of beetle that ancestrally is pre predatory. So you can think of a myrmecophile really as like, you know, a predator with some chemical and behavioral bells and whistles on it that enables it to become specialized on the prey that exists inside an ant colony. Um, and so yeah, I think they're burdensome on, on the colony. But that's not to say that like these interactions are necessarily absolutely negative. So the only other person who's ever done any work on Skeptobius before our lab was a master's student in the 90s uh, who published a tiny little paper in sociobiology, which I have a kind of uh, 
photocopy of a photocopy of. And, uh, and he did this interesting experiment where he took a bunch of velvety tree ants and like put them in tubes with no food, but kept them damp with some, uh, you know, damp cotton. And in half of those tubes, he put one single Skeptobius beetle. And in those tubes that had the beetle, those worker ants lived twice as long as the ones that didn't have the beetle. And there's a few explanations for this. Maybe, you know, grooming removes surface pathogens and parasites, right? In the same way that other animals groom, you know, members of their own species. Maybe you saw the ant kind of fall asleep when the beetle grooms it. Maybe, you know, they're calming the ants down so they're not burning through their reserves through the, you know, being re re repeatedly groomed by this beetle. So, you know, all of that's to say that the beetle, you know, if you could give in any intention to the beetle, it's like it wants to exploit its host. But some of the things it's evolved to be able to do that might, at a single worker level, be kind of beneficial. So, so the other question, and you'll excuse a geneticist question. All right, I'm one of those as well. <laughs> if you look at the frequency of convergent evolution of the, the creation of the symbiotic beetle, yeah. it suggests that there are not going to be large numbers of genetic changes needed to go from yeah. free living to symbiotic. Is, I, I is that, that your sense? Yeah, so I, I, I think na naively I would agree with you. So I think kind of the beetle kind of clearly has an ability to detect ants. Maybe it's a relatively facile genetic change to alter how you respond to that information, right? From, you know, defensive to like, you know, so social and like attractive, okay? And then that's kind of one fundamental. And then the other key thing is, you know, the genetics of cuticular hydrocarbon synthesis is relatively straightforward. And, you know, presumably turning down your CHC production is also genetically quite, quite simple. And that, it, it, I know, I would argue that that's essential to be maybe a very early step in this to move further down this. So those two things combined kind of get you a large part of the way to being kind of specialized looking myrmecophile. So, yeah, and, and the fact that it is so, you know, you know r repetitive. I think the key potentiating thing is the ground plan of the free living beetles, because much more than any other free living insect, they are chemically defended very effectively. They're predatory, they are small body size, and like every time that's evolved in beetles, they've repeatedly moved inside ant colonies. Um, in you know other lineages of road beetles and hysteria clown beetles, those are the kind of potentiating factors I think for. Uh, that was a really fascinating talk. <laughs> I've never really thought about beetles all that much, and uh, and a really sense. like basic question that I'm curious about is why are beetles evolving so much? Like why are there so many different species? Is there like pressure from the dominance of the ants and then yeah. maybe it'll converge to all of the beetles I mean, will be with it's ants? It's the Lord Creator. He just really, really <laughs> has an inordinate fondness for beetles. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, that, that, that is a big question, right? So there's 400,000 species of beetles, but even, so clearly they're doing something right to make more beetles. Uh, and I think the elytron the, is like the probably contributes strongly to that. But then across the beetle phylogeny, it's very asymmetric who's got the most species. So rove beetles have got a ton, right? And then weevils, leaf beetles, longhorn beetles, ground beetles. There are, within the be within the beetles, there's like big asymmetries in who ended up diversifying. So you need to invoke these other lineage specific explanations for why certain groups within the beetles are then diverse. And like, I think kind of, you know, ant pressure in, eco in modern ecosystems, you know, it probably drove a lot of like other insect groups to extinction or like to much more like relictual. And the, the clades that have done well tend to be ones that are chemically defended. Um, and so, you know, in rove beetles, you can kind of, Ha maybe have that as your explanation there. And then in other groups of beetles, it's like co-diversification with angios of flowering plants. So this is why, maybe why there are so many, you know, leaf beetles, weevils, cerambicids, jewel beetles. They seem, the lineages that switch to angiosperm feeding in the Jurassic and Cretaceous from like ancestral cycad and gymnosperm, they're the ones that are really species rich. But even then it depended on acquiring like plant cell wall degrading enzymes and that kind of thing early in their evolution. So 
There's other contributing genomic contingencies. So, uh, fascinating talk. And uh, let's thank the speaker for... Uh, Thanks very much.